Chapter 10, The Chase The Swordless Swordsman The other night, when I hauled Piper from the tree, I was saddened because I missed Quila. I did not know where she was right then, and that was after I vowed to myself that I would always protect her. However, I could not let Piper go alone to rescue Kino. She was a little girl, and her only power was invisibility. Besides, us being both away from Nivedon, she brought forth good memories, what few of them I had, of the place. When the soldier swung his sword at Piper, I had been afraid that the edge would find her. To a swordsman, anything that comes in contact with the blade, no matter how lightly, can be felt. And if that had happened, I was sure that there would have been two bodies now tied to the horse instead of one. We were lucky that night because the soldier guarding Kino was not so strict. But today, our friend was bound with ropes again. He was in a sitting position this time straddled to a horse. Several soldiers were walking around Kino's horse while several soldiers on horses surrounded him. My heart tightened at the sight of Kino being treated like he's a criminal, and the gods only knew that his only offense was really two, I stopped suddenly. Piper was quiet from behind me. Her forehead bumped against my spine as the horse came to an abrupt halt. Why? I asked. Huh? Why did the soldiers take Kino? I need to understand why Kino was handled like this by the soldiers. The emperor's a crazy man, she said. Piper. I hissed. All right, all right. It's a long story, and no one ever really figured out the answer to your question. I mean, who's to say? But these soldiers are going to take Kino to the emperor. Why? Because he wanted Kino dead, she explained. I paled. Was Kino the boy Quila talked about? The one who caused havoc in Canela? In the Akeen Wine Festival? The one who was able to turn himself invisible and manifest distant Tekus at the same time? What is his power, really? He managed to freeze Miro's heart, and he also copied Quila's power. I dismounted and pulled Piper with me. Come on, chum. We have to talk, I said. I walked over to where we could stay hidden and not lose sight of the soldiers. Piper sat beside me. Tell me all that I need to know, I said. I made myself visible and waited for Piper to do the same. When she did not, I told her, show yourself. I need to see your eyes, so I will know you're not lying. Ion Noto I played the message inside my head and called Rodora. The beautiful soldier entered my camp and bowed. You have instructions, General? She asked. We're going to Amer, I said. She looked doubtful. There's a different route that we could take, which could bring us faster to Canela. If we pass by Amer, it would mean a week's delay in reaching the Emperor. We'll reach the Emperor sooner if we go straight to Amer, I said, cutting Rodora short. She looked up at me her eyes squinting. The emperor is in his mother's palace, I said. He's been there for almost a fortnight now, and the information that reached me was that there's no assurance as to when he will leave for Canela. That's the fastest way we can take the boy to him, I said. Rodora smiled. Then, so be it. I nodded. So be it. Mayo Colo I stared at Mistress Lamare's back, and for the hundredth time, I told myself that I could not be mistaken. The resemblance was so considerable even when she had her back turned on me. I mean, could Mistress Lamare possibly have a twin? After all, if Mistress Nia was her twin, it made sense that she could have twins of her own, Ergo, Goami and Miro. Kino never said anything about an aunt, although, come to think of it, Kino never told me anything about his family except for the bits and pieces about his mother. Why could not I remember what her power was? Kino said it had something to do with writing. But what precisely about it? How would I prove to the rest of the gang that Nia was Mistress Lamare? I wish Nia would begin remembering things. I didn't even know how she died. I should have asked Dogen. Anyway, it was all Kino's and his stupid emotions' fault. If he had not rushed away from Dogen, we would perhaps know what happened. If Kino had not sprinted off the way he did, 
maybe this dilemma of mine, of believing that Nia is Lamar A and not being able to prove it, would long be over by now. There was something odd about these twins. Earlier, I saw Goami pull Miro away and heard them talking. But I could not understand what they were discussing. Crazy Miro and his stupid monosyllabic responses. I mean, how difficult is it to say yes or no? Even a toddler could say that. I thought Miro was hiding something. Sometimes his eyes looked lucid enough to me. I don't know. Maybe I could trap him. If only I weren't so scared of his power. Quila, I don't think we can catch up to the soldiers fast enough, I said. What are you saying? We need to find a shortcut. Or find some other way to make the soldiers run slower. How in the world are we going to do that? I don't even know where we are, she said. I scratched my head, disappointed. Ask Goami. She's been traveling all her life. Maybe she would be able to look for a faster route, I said. All right, she said before kicking her horse several times to catch up with the others. Wait up, Quila shouted when only a few yards separated us. Nia pulled at the reins, and the horse slowed down before it wriggled its head and turned to face us. We can't camp again, Goemi said. We started on the journey an hour ago. No. It's not that, Quila said. We have to be faster. How can we do that? Goemi seemed to consider what Quila said. Reroute. I nodded. Yes, we have to find another way. Fishing, Miro said. Stupid Miro, I muttered under my breath. Goemi's eyes lit up. That's right. We can't go fishing. There's got to be another way, I said. No. Follow us, Goemi said. Then she pointed Nia in a different direction. On the riverbank, several dark-skinned men were wearing wide-brimmed hats. The sleeves of their shirts were rolled up to their elbows. Nia was talking to them. Quila was also with them holding her pouch of gold coins. After a while, everybody seemed to be in agreement, and Nia and Quila walked towards us. I stood up. What now? They gave us passage. Go me paled. How many coins? Arden won't mind, Quila said. You shouldn't have been open-fisted spending them. The coins would be the manifestation of Arden's dream, Goemi said. Quila flushed, and her eyes registered fury, but she did not say anything. Ready? Nia asked. I nodded and mounted the horse while Nia began pulling at the other horse. When we reached the bank, the two men helped us ride the boat. I caught my breath as the horse danced, afraid of the sudden motion the boat made. I exhaled when I had crossed the boat and recognized that I had made a huge mistake. I shouldn't have ridden the horse into the boat. The horse and I could have fallen, and rescue would have been difficult. I waited while Nia, Goami, Quila, and Miro came on board. How many days, Master Damien? Nia asked. Three days if the gods will permit. Where will we be in three days? I asked. North of Amer a town behind the Queen's Palace, Master Damien said. We're lucky. The winds are with us. The current is also strong. If this doesn't change, we could be there even before noon of the third day. Nia nodded. Very well, Master Damien, she said. We'll take the cabin and rest for a while. The vessel wasn't so big. In fact, if we had another horse with us, I was almost sure that the vessel would sink if we were to encounter rough waters. But it was fast, and the two men who were steering it seemed to be experts in plying the waters. Is there a cook? I asked. Nia laughed. No. This is not a ship. And we have to rely on hard bread and stew. That's what you always fed Kino. I yelled. Nia flushed. She looked at the rest of the group and me before answering. Well, if you're telling the truth, that would make me a terrible mother if that's what I only got to feed him. She laughed nervously. Her brow rose in doubt. Come on, let's get inside the room and eat whatever we have in our packs. Quila jabbed me with her elbow as I entered the room. 
Better keep your mouth shut. Do you really want Crazy Miro to freeze your heart? Of course not. I wanted to tell her. But it wasn't my fault that I said what I had. The words escaped my mouth involuntarily. The room was no bigger than Kino's room in their hut. A double bunk bed was situated in the far end, and that was it. Miro sat down on the bottom bunk, and Nia sat beside him. Goemi did too, which left the top bunk for Quila and me. I sighed as I climbed the wooden ladder and bumped my head against the ceiling. Quila seemed to have a much better job at climbing. She sat beside me with ease. I thought we were going to eat, I said. Well, go fetch something from your pack, Quila said. I grunted as I pulled open the string that held the canvas bag closed. I peered inside and counted the apples. Only three were remaining, and there were three days ahead of us. I grabbed one and bit it, then handed it to Quila, who did the same. Then she tossed the apple down to Goami. After a few seconds, Nia stood up and gave me back the core of the apple and two pieces of hard bread. I gave one to Quila and grumbled. How are we going to survive like this? When I finished chewing the bread, I lay down in bed and moved towards the wall. My back was against Quila. If there was nothing else to eat, I better sleep and ignore the rumbling of my stomach. When I woke up, Quila was no longer beside me. I climbed down the bunk bed ladder and yelped when I found myself eye to eye with Miro. Where are they? I asked him. He did not answer me but I could swear that he looked at me with hatred. He dropped his gaze to his lap. I walked outside and tripped when the boat lurched. Then I pulled myself up and walked outside the room. The cold breeze greeted me. Nia and the other girls were sitting on a bench and were staring ahead. Finally, you're awake. Quila said. Goemi eyed me warily before looking ahead again. I was trying to quench my hunger, I offered as an excuse. There's the soup we left for you. Master Damien cooked for us. There's also fish. Help yourself, Nia offered. I grinned and sat beside them and helped myself to a big enough serving of fish. It did not matter that it looked burned. At least my hunger would be relieved. Where are we? Are we close enough? I asked. Goemi grunted. We're only on day one. What did you expect? I did not answer her sarcasm and instead focused on the fish. It would do little for my pride if I ended up choking on a fishbone. The silence was deafening, and I became scared again. Maybe it was because of the grim attitude of my companions. They're going to be all right, I offered. What makes you so sure? Quila said. I thought about it. Piper and Arden can make themselves invisible, I said. As for Kino, I did not know what his power was now. Will you tell me more about Kino? Nia said. I smiled to myself. Maybe there's some way I can convince Nia that Kino is her son. He's a good guy. He's my best friend, I said. She waited for more. He's all right, I guess. I mean, for a child who didn't have any power, he dealt with the bullying pretty well. If I were in his shoes, I might have rebelled and refused to attend Professor Levin's classes. Who's Professor Levin? Nia asked. He's our power-toning professor, I said. He teaches us how to control our power. Kino hated attending his classes, but he bore each one because that's the kind of good person he is. Mama, I thought you said you believed me? Goemi interrupted. Nia looked at her and put an arm over her shoulder. I do but I want to know more about the boy we're rescuing, she said mildly. I frowned. It is not his fault that he's being pursued by the emperor, I said. Nia looked grim. I don't understand that. Why? Oh well, here we go again. I needed to tell the gruesome story of Kino's life. Perhaps instead of becoming a soldier, I should aspire to be a bard so that I could do just that. We wanted to be registered as citizens in the books, but the only way to do that was to display our power in front of the emperor. Kino had no power before all this ruckus began, so he tricked the emperor into believing he had Distantecus, I said. Distantecus? 
Nia asked. That's one of the strongest powers. It is. Maybe that's what freaked out the emperor. Quila was listening to our conversation as though she was processing all the information I was sharing with the group. How did he manage to trick the emperor? I beamed. It was a neat trick. We met Piper, a ghost. Nia turned to look at me. Ghost? I nodded rapidly. A Niven. But before, I thought of her as a ghost. She can turn herself invisible, so she did that and lifted a wooden box in front of the emperor. Wow, Nia said, odd. But that wasn't when the emperor got mad, I said, pausing for effect. All three of them turned to stare at me. Weren't any of you there? I asked. That's the grandest event every year, and Akeens shouldn't miss it. Quila rolled her eyes. Arden didn't want to go, so I was stuck with him in Lundu. And you? I asked Gomi. We missed it, she said. But we almost made it to the festival. It was a good thing, though, I mean, missing the festival. Otherwise, I don't know if Miro and I would have survived it. And Nia? I pressed. Gomi flushed. It took her a few seconds before answering. Mama would have survived it, she said softly. Was she with you? I pressed Goami. Then to Nia, I added, were you there? Nia shook her head. I don't remember. She was with us. Goami said. She held my gaze. She's keeping something from us, I could tell. But what? Why would Nia have survived it? I asked. Because she's quick. She can outrun anybody, Goemi defended. But she wouldn't leave you and Mira behind, so no matter how quickly she can run, she could have ended up dead, too, I said. I was observing Goemi's reaction. Something's got to give. Yeah. But we would have outrun them all, Goemi said. I decided not to push the topic. So what else happened? Quila asked. The emperor got mad when he learned who Kino's mother was, I said, eyeing Nia. If Nia was shocked, she hid it well. She stared at me, mouth slightly open. He ordered Kino to be killed after he learned that Lamari Amark was his mother, I finished. Nia shivered visibly. You're freaking us out. Quila said. Stop it now. That's the truth, I said. So, it wasn't really Kino the soldiers were after? Quila asked again. I shook my head. I don't know. All I remember was that the earth rumbled beneath our feet, and lightning started splitting the sky. A lot of people died. Even some of my friends, I said solemnly. Under the pale moonlight, Lamare looked to have lost blood. Do you remember anything? I asked her. She held my gaze before shaking her head. If the Emperor were pursuing Lamare, and you're accusing me of being Kino's mother, then. Her words trailed off. You are in danger, too, I said. Which was why you died. But apparently, you didn't, I finished. Gomi flared up. Stop telling all these lies, Mayo, she shouted. It's not a lie. How many times do I have to tell you? I said. When we get to rescue them, we will find out who between us have been lying all along, she said as though a threat. Enough, Nia said. Let's focus on saving them. Then we will figure out what to do next when we're all together. Goemi looked worried, but she gazed at me as though she wanted to plant a dagger into my back, and I grew scared. I wasn't able to finish the fish after that. I was worried that the twins would find a way to get rid of me when I fell asleep. I glanced at Quila, who seemed to be working on the information I had revealed. It did not look as though she believed me, but the good thing was, it did not look as though she also bought Goemi's stories. The Swordless Swordsman It's a mare, I said, amazed at the vast province. From where we were standing, the white palace walls were glinting as the light touched them. It was as I remembered it some moon turns ago. Piper peered from my back. That is one grand castle. 
Canellan Palace is majestic, but this, she said in awe, pausing, is what grandeur means. Look at all those columns. And the lawn. And the brass are all shining. I nodded. This was why the Queen had so many gold coins to spare on a lowly performer like me. Are you sure the soldiers went inside? Piper asked. Aha, uh -huh, I replied. Maybe we can find out something from the townsfolk, Piper said. She jumped from the horse and became visible. I'll try to listen in on any gossip, she said. I nodded. Meet me here after an hour. I will make the rounds, too, I said. Then Piper went away. It felt odd to be back in the place I promised Quila I would take her and yet not be with her. I had told her all about Amer and the Amerisian Palace. I hated to admit it, but the plump, pretty girl's presence was sorely missed now. I wished Goumi were with me. If she were, I would have taken her to the famous inn that served crabs as big as my head. She would have liked that very much. Right now, though, other things are more important. I had to save Kino. I dismounted from the horse and started walking around. It was true. One will soon learn that useful information could come from gossip if only one knew how to sift the truth from the embellishments. I made myself visible and tipped my hat upwards. All I had to do was grin at ladies, and I was sure I would be able to make them tell. An open bar was situated right in front of me, and I walked towards it. Several men were drinking, and one or two were drunk based on how red their skins had already become. The maiden who was serving ale frowned as one of the men slapped her behind and thrust an empty mug towards her. I helped myself to a barstool right in front of the maiden and put on my most charming smile. How many mugs can I buy with this? I asked, tossing a gold coin in the air and then catching it again with my open palm. I grinned at the maiden. Her frown vanished as her eyes landed on the gold coin. For that, you can even take me home, she said good-naturedly. Bella. The drunk man yelled. Where's my ale? The maiden, whose name was Bella, glanced back at the man. Forgive me, lad, she said. I have to bring this back, or else I'll lose my toil. But stay there. I'll have your drink fast. She turned away, and I watched with a wide grin plastered on my face as her hip swayed gracefully. The maiden was very pretty. As promised, she came back to me with a mug full of ale. She gave me a huge smile. I grinned at her and drank. What's someone like you doing in a place like this? I asked. The silver is good, she said, blushing. Her green eyes were huge and framed with long lashes. When she looked down at the mug, her lashes almost touched her cheek. The gold is the devil, I said. She giggled and nodded. A girl needs the devil to survive, she said playfully. That's something I wouldn't know, I flirted. I looked around, removed my hat, and put it on the table. I brushed my hair up the way I knew girls liked it before winking at Bella. What's the news around here, Bella? I asked matter-of-factly. She scrunched her nose. Nothing new. These cratty drunkards always litter the bars as though they had all the money in the world. I chuckled. Wouldn't that be something you should be thankful for? Not if they never tip, she said. I laughed again and downed the last of my ale. Can I have another mug? I asked, grinning. She took my mug and brought back another one filled with ale. So, really, don't tell me you spend days and nights here not hearing about anything new? I said as soon as she was in front of me. She rubbed her hands against her apron eyes narrowing at me. Are you looking for someone? Because I have connections with spies, she whispered. I coughed, and a mouthful of ale sprinkled from my mouth. No. What makes you think that? I said. You kept on asking about the news. Well, anyway, the emperor's here in the queen's palace, she said. What? I asked, trying to hide the panic in my voice. He came here a fortnight ago. The emperor is still here? Bella shook her head. No. He left. You missed him by a day. I drank in relief. Yesterday morning, 
we thought there was a storm coming. The skies grew dark so suddenly, and we went out to see what was happening. It was incredible to see the emperor's power on display. There was a thick cloud formation that passed above us all, and the emperor was writing it together with his soldiers, she said. I wiped the ale that dripped down my chin. That must be quite a sight. Why did the emperor come here? Bella shook her head. Nobody knows. The royals' businesses are their own. It will do you good not to ask about it, or your pretty head could end up on a pike. The queen, is she in the palace? I asked. What is your business with her majesty? We waifs like to rub elbows with royalty, I said in jest. Bella laughed. You are much too young to know how to flirt. But you are so smooth with your words. And you have a pretty face. Come back to me when you're twenty. I'll be waiting, she said jokingly. I grinned at her and leaned forward until my lips brushed her cheek quickly. That's for luck, I said. Then I grabbed my hat and threw it up in the air. As usual, I jumped up to catch the hat with my head. Bella giggled like the other maidens I had met in the past. Then I tossed her the gold coin. See you when I'm twenty, I said. Bella grinned and waved. Sometimes, it felt nice to look pretty. I mean, I can live without being pretty, but it certainly has its perks. I wondered where Piper could be and what news she was able to gather. Piper San Diego. You reek of tobacco. I complained. Arden grinned at me. Where did you go anyway? I asked. Just around, he answered, his words a bit muddled. Are you drunk? Two mugs of ale can't sink me, he replied. He was still wearing a wide grin. I knew it. Instead of asking for information, you went around throwing off your money on ale. Arden shook his head. Whoa, that's not it, chum. I got us some really useful information, he said. The emperor was here. Was? When did he leave? I asked, concerned. Yesterday. But the good thing is he's gone, so there's still some time for us to rescue your friend. I walked in circles in front of him. Canella could not be that far away from a mayor in a few days perhaps were all it would take to be face to face with the emperor. We have to rescue Kino fast. We have to rescue him now. I said. Arden's expression changed. He became serious and slumped to the ground. Quit walking around. You're making me dizzy, he complained. If you had not drunk ale, this wouldn't have bothered you, I said, but I sat beside him. What are we going to do? What did you learn? He asked. The soldiers were there, but they haven't met the queen yet. That's what I heard. They were still waiting to be received by the queen, which means we don't have much time. Arden looked thoughtful. The only way we can rescue Kino is if we go inside the palace walls, and we can't. I wailed. Please stop talking in high tones. I thought my ears would get some rest because Quila isn't with me, he said. I frowned at him. I still could not figure out a way to get into the palace. Wait, we can pass the gates by making ourselves invisible. That would work. So, are we going there tonight? It may be so soon but it's Kino's neck on the line. I know, I know. But we have to come up with a plan first. We can't barge in there and just take Kino away. How do you suppose we can get to him? We need a distraction, I said. Something that could draw the attention of the soldiers. And then, when most of them are gathered in one place, we will pounce and find out where Kino is. Do you think you can find Kino alone? He said. I think so but you have to come with me so we can roam the grounds faster. No. I will provide the distraction, but you have to be the one to find him. And how do you propose to do that? I asked. Arden grinned mischievously. I wanted to hit him with a bat for being mysterious about his plan. When the sun was starting to set, Arden nudged me. Come on. It's time to pay Her Majesty a visit, he said. Do you think it will work? I asked him. I'm positive. All right, I said. Arden walked away, and I turned invisible. The plan was that we would enter the palace gates together. He would come in as a performer, and I would pass through the guards unnoticed by being invisible. 
As soon as we reached the gate, Arden said, Good luck, chum. Take Kino to the horse as soon as you can. I nodded. My palms started to sweat in nervousness, but there was no going back now. If we are to rescue Kino, the best time is now. Good luck with your performance. I hope the queen remembers you. Arden smiled. No one who has seen this face will ever forget it, he said before winking. At least he had the confidence to joke about our situation. For that, I was thankful as some of my nervousness died down. My knees were still shaking as I began to cross the palace gates. Marcella Benilda Ion Noto was a big man. His shoulders were so broad that if he were to pass the door of my chambers, anyone following him would have to wait for his turn because the two of them would not fit comfortably together in the doorway. His almond-shaped eyes were staring at me with obvious concern. He looked disappointed. I wondered if it had been right to make him wait for two days before I granted his request for an audience. He is a brusque man, and his reputation preceded him. With him around, even at the confines of my palace, I did not feel safe. It is an honor to have a war general visit my palace, I began. But forgive my curiosity. What is it that brought this great honor to my house? Your Majesty, I heard the news that the Emperor was here. News does travel fast. And what of that? I asked. I have a present for him, Ion said. A present? Ion looked back at his soldiers and clapped his hands twice. Present him to the queen, he said. The soldiers that were standing behind him moved sideways as though an invisible line divided them. At the back of them was a horse, and a boy was sitting on the saddle. I squinted to see who it was and was horrified to find a bloody boy with a bandage wrapped around his leg. What is this? I demanded. Pardon me, my queen, but the correct question is, who is this boy? He said. I unmotioned for the soldier to escort the boy forward, and he walked towards me. When the horse was beside Ion, the soldier pulled at the horse's reins to make it stop. May I present to you, Kino Amurk, Ion Noto said. The boy the emperor wanted. I hardly recognized the boy. The last time I saw him, he was in much better condition. The one in front of me now had longer, ruffled brown hair. His face was swollen on the right side, and his right eye was puffed closed. His hands were tied with ropes, and his left foot was in a bandage. I gasped. What did you do to him? I asked. We captured him. When we heard that the emperor was here in Amer, I steered my soldiers towards Amer so the emperor could receive his gift. It is disappointing to find out that he has departed. I rushed forward and stopped in front of the boy. My heart melted at the sight of his bruised face. His clothes were torn, and his lips were pale. He had his eyes on the floor. Look at me, boy, I said. The boy turned to look at me slowly. His lips parted when his eyes met mine. He probably remembered the time when I visited his house. I turned to look at Ion. This is what brought you to my palace? I said in rage. To show my people what glory it will bring a war general to capture a boy? You must be out of your mind, I spat. Ion's jaw hardened. Your Majesty, it was what the Emperor ordered. An order of a madman. I shrieked. Look at the boy. Tell me how he could be dangerous to the Emperor's reign. Ion's eyes narrowed dangerously as he stared at me with hatred. You may be a queen, but you have no right to call the Emperor a madman. I can have you arrested for that. Laras moved forward, and I heard the sound his sword made as it was unsheathed. There's no need for that, Laras, I said. I will not have my palace shamed by keeping a general that takes pride from the capture of a boy. I unclenched his fist. His jaw hardened even more. The soldiers behind him put their hands on their swords. This time, it was he who raised his left arm towards his soldiers. There's no need to draw blood in Her Majesty's presence, he said coldly. We will leave now. He turned and started walking away. You will not shame my house by leaving on the same day you were granted an audience, I said with authority. Ion turned towards me again. What is it you propose, your majesty? Stay the night. Let me feed your men. But at the breaking of dawn, leave as though you weren't here. I support my son in his plans, in what he plans to do to Akia, but I will not tolerate the hunting of boys who have not even tasted the kiss of a young woman. Ion stood stiffly, his eyes were still burning with rage, but he knew his place, 
and he would not dare argue with the queen in the presence of her soldiers. By your leave, your majesty. Let my men make camp, he said through clenched teeth. I nodded reluctantly. Leave the boy with me, I said. That is not possible. Are you to question the order of a queen? If anything happens to the boy, if he escapes, you will answer to me, he shouted. Laras moved forward, unsheathed his sword, and in one fluid motion thrust the sword against Ion. One word, my queen, and this man will meet his ancestors. Grant me the grace to be the one to make it happen, Laras said. I won't have it, Laras, I said. My heart pumped. If Ion were to unsheathe his sword, there would be bloodshed. And I can't have it now. Take back what you said, General. And I will forget this happened, I commanded. Ion stared at the tip of Laras's sword before his face broke into a sarcastic smile. Do you know that I can easily drag you out and beat you using your own sword? He sneered at Laras. Then, why don't you? Laras said. His gaze was unwavering. Because I do not fight someone who is not my equal, Ion said. As opposed to a boy who should still be suckling milk from his mother. Ion drew out his sword. You will not shame me in front of my men, he told Laras. Death finds those who seek it, I said in a cold voice. Silence came after that. Then slowly, Laras sheathed his sword, and Ion followed. Ion glared at me. Then he bowed and said, By your leave, your majesty. I nodded. Ion turned and walked away, followed by his men. I was able to breathe after that. Laras looked up at me and bowed. He was furious, I could tell, but he did not say anything to shame his queen. He muttered a soft, By your leave, my queen, and when I nodded, he left on the other side of the chambers. I was left staring at the boy who was shivering. Do you remember me, boy? I asked gently. He nodded. Then I motioned for my maidservants. Bathe the boy and feed him. He will rest for the night. A manservant moved forward and released the ropes that bound the boy's wrist and carried him from the horse. The boy sagged against the man, and I felt sorry for the boy. He reminded me of my son, a boy who had no idea how cruel life could get when I left him moon turns ago. This boy, like my son, was another victim of fate, and yet there was nothing that could be done to twist it. Tonight though, I would let this boy find comfort in my palace. Tomorrow, he will be Ion Noto's captive again. My advisor, Doran Loxa, an old and pudgy man, walked towards me. Your Majesty, a performer is seeking your audience, she said. A performer. If it had been any other day, perhaps I would have said no. But the day had been stressful, and it would do well to the soldiers and my men to have some amusement. Bring him in, I said, remembering a performer in Lundu and hoping that it was he who was seeking an audience with me. I proved to be correct because in a few minutes, a beautiful golden-haired lad strode forward, and when he was in front of me, he took off his hat and bowed gracefully. He was indeed the boy from Lundu. My queen, it is an honor to be in your presence once more, he said with his head bowed. Even his voice was beautiful. I could not help it. I smiled at him, wishing again that this was how wind had been as a lad. Ion Noto? Who did he think he was? Lara Sendo will be a dead man soon, I vowed. It was bad enough that the queen did not share my delight in the boy's captivity, but to be chastised like a child in front of my men. I would not allow such an act to pass me by without vengeance. The emperor would learn about this, and Lara Sendo and the queen would pay for my shame. General, Rodora said from behind me. Tell the men to camp outside the gates. We will not obey, I said. It isn't wise, General, Rodora said. I turned to face her. Who gave you the right to question my authority? I will not take it from you, I said vehemently. If you shame the queen, you will lose your honor. Be the bigger man. Do as the protocol dictates, and have your retaliation later on. My blood was boiling, and I could not think straight. They shamed me in front of the men who surrendered their lives to me. The men, who upon my whim, would claim their own lives had I ordered it. What mask do I put on so I could face them again? I sneered at her. The mask of humility, Rodora said. She walked closer, and when she was within reach, 
she raised her right hand to touch my face. You will be honored by the emperor as soon as he learns about what you did today. He will bring you justice, Ion. I stirred at Rodora's gentle touch. She slid her fingers down my face until her fingers rested on my lips. I stared into her blue eyes and wondered what she was up to. But before I could put together the answers to my questions, she gave them to me. She brought her lips upon mine and captured my mouth in a kiss. I am only a man, and tonight, I have a need to conquer. I returned the kiss and pulled at Rodora's body. The Swordless Swordsman The queen was as beautiful as I remembered her, although this time, I was able to take note of the lines across her forehead, which spoke of the moon turns that she had lived. I was in the middle of the stage, the curtains were still drawn down. A box of assorted fruits was beside me, and I studied its contents. I took an apple and started eating. You're not allowed to eat that, the manservant told me. That's for the show. I grinned at him. It's all right. The queen likes me, I said. The manservant punched me in the stomach, and I hurled, clutching at my stomach. You will not make such jokes, he warned. I coughed. Gods, the punch was hard. I stood up slowly, pulled a chair, and sat on it. Stupid manservant. He was acting as though he was royalty. These people could really be so irritating. I wondered where Piper was and hoped that she had been successful in finding Kino. The curtains moved, and a pretty slave with a beautiful tan looked at me. It's time for your show, she said. I nodded and waited for the curtains to open. Piper San Diego Kino was not in the dungeons, and he wasn't with the soldiers either. Where could he be? I was tired and hungry and worried and scared that all of the negative energy was getting to me. What if I could not find him? This is the only chance Arden and I have at rescuing him. We could not fail. I went to the kitchen, hid behind the long tables, and waited until the cooks had turned their backs. I decided to go under the table even though I was invisible so that no one would have the chance to bump against me. Tonight, they were preparing for a huge dinner the queen was throwing for the war general. I crawled to the opposite side of the table and found myself staring at a cat. Dear gods, this cat would sense me. The cat let out a loud purring sound, and the fat cook bent down. Upon seeing the cat, he gathered it in his arms, almost brushing me, and threw the cat out of the window. Silly cat's been making funny sounds, he said. It's only a cat. You shouldn't be so hard on it, another one said. Bah! It's a thief! been eating the fish we prepared for the queen's guests. They're not such good men. I tell you, that cat is doing the food justice. I'd rather have it eat the food we cook than have those soldiers eat their full. Then go get the cat back and feed it. The man shouted. You are a harsh man, the other said. I kept on crawling until I reached the other end of the table, then I stood up and grabbed a piece of bread. I was so hungry that I gulped it down in seconds. The table was full of pastries and other colorful food that I didn't know existed. What I would do to taste all of them. If Mayo were here, I'm sure he would have a feast. I took a pastry with cream on top and gobbled it. It was delicious. Sweeter than anything I had ever tasted. The fat cook turned towards the table and stared at the space where the pastry had been. His eyes rounded, and his nostrils flared. See? That stupid cat stole my dessert. He raged. I crept silently out of the kitchen until I could no longer hear the curses of the cook. Now, where could Kino be? I finished scouting the yard, the kitchen, the dungeons, the palace halls, and still, there was no sign of Kino. Where was he? I stopped walking and pressed my back against a wall when I heard footsteps approaching me. Two servants were talking to each other. Did you hear what happened to the general? The thin one asked. No. Spill. The thinner one answered. He was shamed by the queen. That's his punishment for taking a boy as a captive. The other servant shook her head in disgust. And you know what he said? That it was the emperor's order. No. He couldn't have. He's the queen's son, and she's a good queen. How in the moon's names could she have an offspring as twisted as he is? Watch your tongue. 
These walls have ears, the servant said. I decided to follow them. What happened to the boy? The thinner one asked. He's being cleaned and fed. I don't know. If I were the queen, I wouldn't give him back to the general. But if she doesn't do that, the queen will be at the emperor's mercy. Do you think so? She's his mother. Don't underestimate the vileness that runs in the emperor's veins. But he's so good looking. Lucinda. The other servant giggled. But he is. Admit it, she said. Wait, there's Martha. The other servant said. Hey Martha, where's the boy? Lucinda asked. The older servant who answered to the name Martha rolled her eyes at the two younger women. He's resting now. I held my breath. Please tell me where he is. Where is he? Lucinda asked. I am not allowed to tell. Her Majesty's order, Martha said coldly as though it was such a privilege to be entrusted with the information. I was still holding my breath. Please, please say where Kino is. You snob. You think you're better than us. Bah. Lucinda said before walking away. Martha stared at Lucinda's back with hatred. The other servant remained. What are you looking at? Martha fumed. Nothing, the other servant mumbled. At last, I could hold it no more. I said, where is the boy? Martha shrieked and grabbed the other servant, who also screamed, rivaling the sound that Martha made. Lucinda came running back. What is it? Somebody spoke. Ha! Huh. That's for being so snotty parading your nose up in the air when you're like. Where is he? I yelled. This time, all three of them shrieked, hugging each other. Did you hear that? Martha asked. It sounded like a little girl. I've heard stories about little girl ghosts roaming the palace before. Lucinda nodded in high speed, and she all but pressed her face against the older woman's chest. It was such a funny sight, and I would have stayed and played tricks with them if only I weren't pressed for time. Our tenets bound Nivens not to play tricks on other Akins, so it was only now that I learned how much fun it was to scare non-Nivens. If you don't tell me where he is, I'm going to pinch your butt, I said. Martha yelped and pressed her back against the wall to protect her buttocks. Third floor, first door on the left, she said, her voice quivering in fear. Thanks, I said before running away silently. I did not want them to think that I had fled them. I glanced back and saw them huddled together. It was your snotty nose's fault. Lucinda said, they were looking around as though they were expecting somebody else to speak up. Kino Amerk. I felt hot all over. I remember talking to a queen, a woman who visited me long ago, someone who made my sleep disturbed by dreams, but it was as though all that happened in the past day was not real. When I hit the warm water, I shivered, and my body convulsed. Then I heard the servants chattering about the festering wound in my leg. Another one yelped and said that it was as hot as the burned cooking of Anton, the fat cook. Then they giggled. Another servant chastised them and told them to tend to my wound. Everything came in a blur. I remembered tasting goo. It felt soft and slimy in my mouth, and they told me to swallow it, so I did. But it tasted like wood. Now, I stared at the flickering lamp on the left side of the bed. I raised my head, but my surroundings swirled so quickly that I had no option but to put my head back on the soft pillow. I had never laid my head on something so soft, and although I was drowsy, I managed to smile. A pinching pain made my left leg jerk. I flailed as though I had no control over my body. I was burning like I had been dipped in boiling water and, after that, was put on a sizzling metal plate. But everything would be better now. At least that's what the servant told me. She told me that the queen would not let me be taken by the general. Did they know that the emperor wanted me dead? That it was I who caused the emperor to rage during the Akin wine festival? That it was I who caused the death of some of their families, friends, and acquaintances? Had they known, would they have treated me so kindly? Mother's face entered my mind, and I smiled. Mother. I called her name, fervently wishing that she was the one taking care of me. That she would see me through this. That when all of this was over, I would gaze at her face. I tried to recall the last time she told me she loved me. 
It was from a long time ago, right before Dogen took her away. Right before Piper, Mayo, Kogi, and I headed to the ghost town. What was the ghost town? What were Nivens? Piper was a ghost. I shivered and shut my eyes. I clutched at the blanket covering me. It felt like silk, and I wasn't accustomed to its sheerness. It felt so smooth that I was afraid I would fall off the bed. But if I fell off the bed, what then? Did anybody ever die by falling from the bed? If yes, would I choose to fall and meet my untimely death? Maybe all of this suffering would be over. Perhaps, this was all a bad dream, and when I came to, I would find myself in Wawang, in a hut with my mother. Mom, I called inside my head. But she's dead. Dogen betrayed me. He must have killed her. The gall of that soldier for running after me after he let my mother die. I would kill him when I got older. I would kill him. The general hadn't pulled the tip of the arrow from my leg. He said that it was punishment for hitting him. Then the servants opened my leg with a knife and removed the metal tip. They said if they did not, the wound would not heal, and they would have to cut off my leg. I cried and shivered. Sleep, foolish boy, I told myself. Sleep and forget about everything. Forget your mother. Forget the general. Forget the emperor. Die in your sleep. Because if you die, no one can come after you. And you would win this battle you did not know you were fighting. I twisted as another burning pain shot at my leg. It was becoming numb now. I hoped it would numb forever so that I would not hurt any more. I wanted to write. I wanted to write the way the kind soldier had told me to. I would write about my pain because, sooner or later, my friends would not want to listen to my complaints. The soldier was right. No one would want to hear me ranting on and on about the pain of losing my mother. Where was my parchment? The general must have taken my pen. I cried again. Mom, I called out. Please, Mom. Please. I need you. I felt a hand touch my face, but when I opened my eyes to see who it was, no one was there. I smiled. Maybe this was how dying felt. I smiled again and prayed that this would be over soon. And then that would mean I beat all of them. The pain of losing a mother. The general. The emperor. No one could kill me when I'm dead. I started laughing. The hand kept on brushing my hair. Kino, the voice said. I smiled. It was such a pretty voice. It was like listening to the sound an angel makes. The gods must be waiting for me now. Take me with you, I said feverishly. It was difficult for me to speak. My throat hurts. The angel answered, Wake up, Kino. We're here to rescue you. I opened my eyes and gazed at an angel. She had Piper's blue eyes. I smiled at her and said softly, You look like Piper. She doesn't have wings either. Then my head rolled to the side, and I did not remember anything more. Piper San Diego. Wake up, Kino, I said in a rush. Wake up. But Kino lay there staring at me and rambling incoherently. Then he drifted off. How will I escape with him now? I can't carry him. I shook Kino's shoulders to wake him up. Please, wake up. If the servants had overcome their fear, I might find them here soon. Please, wake up, I kept on telling Kino. When he still lay motionless, I stood up and looked around, trying to find a way to take him with me. But he was bigger than I. And I could not carry him. Maybe it should have been Arden to rescue him. I could have easily provided the distraction. I walked in circles again, trying to think of a way to bring Kino out of the palace without anybody noticing, but it seemed like I ran out of ideas. I stopped and listened. Footsteps were coming. Dear gods. Not now. Ragan Sayer. For what the queen had done, I was grateful. The boy was so pitiful, and I did not know why the emperor wanted him. After I learned that the boy had lost his mother, I tried to hold him and tell him that it was going to be all right. It was not right for the gods to have made him suffer a mother's loss and then to let a heartless general capture him. 
I lost my wife and son not so long ago, and I feel for anyone who has ever suffered the same. Sometimes, I even wish that I could be with my family. If it were meant to happen that Kino Amrik is handed to the Emperor, I could only wish that it would be under the hands of General Renner Kolo. He was fierce in battle, but he was never mean. A true leader. That's why for moon turns now, I had always yearned for a reassignment. Maybe next moon turn, I would get to be so lucky as to serve under him. I went to the general's room and found him with Rodora. I was shocked at first, but I managed to mask my surprise. It was normal. The general was putting on his clothes while Rodora still lay in bed. At least I would be the one to guard the boy tonight, and tomorrow, the one to ride with him on the horse. He did not deserve to suffer so much. If at all, the least I could do was to let him ride in comfort before the emperor did to him what he wanted. I walked in long strides and found the door where Kino was kept. I turned the knob and pushed at the door. Marcella Benilda. The servants did a marvelous job at having the hall ready for the festivity. It helped that my son was here the other day and that the hall was still filled with the long mahogany tables gilded with emeralds and rubies. I sat on the throne and looked around. To my left side was a stage where the swordless swordsmen, as the lad had asked to be referred, would perform. In front of me were long tables for dining. Ian Noto's place at the table was still unoccupied, and it made me fume. If he did not show himself tonight, I would not forget this day. I glanced up as the sounds of heavy footsteps entered. Ion was followed by his soldiers. He locked eyes with me as he moved forward, and right before sitting, he bowed. I nodded, and he sat down. At least he knew his place. The tightness around his eyes was still there. It caused me to worry, but tonight, maybe the tricks of the performer could ease the tension between us. The curtain opened, and the swordless swordsman came out. He was a pretty boy who knew very well how pretty he was and who used his charisma in drawing the crowd. Your Majesty, he said, bowing. The audience cheered him on. He went to his box and took a pair. Similar to the last performance of him that I had seen, he threw the pair up in the air and slashed at it as though he was wielding a sword, and the pair fell on the floor, all eight pieces of it, cut in equal parts. The crowd cheered, and the lad bowed down. The red cape he put on looked good on him. Then he did the same with the apple, orange, and several other fruits that he could throw up. Somehow, due to the monotony of the performance, the crowd seemed less enthused as the performance continued. Dinner was served, and the clinking of the utensils filled the air. From the long dining tables, conversations began to arise, and I was left watching the performer. The swordless swordsman, as though sensing the crowd's boredom, bent down and pulled out a huge pumpkin from the box. It was so big that he was barely able to lift it. The crowd yelled, urging him to throw it up in the air. The lad smiled graciously and refused. Watch closely, he said. The lad danced as though he was a warrior with a sword. His movements were fluid and graceful, and I was awed. When he turned in circles, he raised his right foot up and thrust his hand towards the pumpkin without touching it. He moved his arms as though he was drawing a pattern on the pumpkin. Then he bowed down. The crowd became silent. What was that? Nothing happened. A soldier complained. He was with Ion Noto. The lad grinned and tapped his right foot on the stage. Like magic, the skin of the pumpkin fell on the floor like they were the petals that bloomed from a bud. The swordless swordsman tapped his foot, and this time, the pumpkin's meat came off, leaving the seeds in the middle. The crowd laughed. It was an uproar, and the lad bowed in front of all of us. He had turned away after the display with flair when a soldier stood up and called him. Hey, lad, the soldier shouted. Then he threw an apple up in the air. In a swift movement, the lad put a hand over his left waist like he was unsheathing a sword, then he thrust his hand upwards and slashed several times. The apple came down peeled. The crowd gave off another enthused applause with them thumping on the tables. I was on the edge of my seat, carefully watching the lad's movement. If I had not paid attention to his movements, I would have missed the delicate jerking of his right hand as though he was putting a sword back to its scabbard. I stared at his left side and, for the first time, noticed a bulge on the side of his waist. When the lad bowed down again, I could not be mistaken anymore. There was a pointed thing thrusting out towards the back of his cape. It was like he really did have a sword. 
I stood up, and my eyes never left him until he was back behind the curtains. Your Majesty, Lara said. What's wrong? Find him. Bring him to me. Don't let him leave the palace, I said. My heart started to pound. Could he be the swordsman in my dream? The one who would kill my son? Laras nodded and stood up, but before he could follow the lad, a soldier came in. He was a huge man but still smaller than Ion. He looked around as though trying to find someone. Then his eyes locked against Ion's. General, the boy is missing, he said. All at once, the soldiers rose, both those who had come with Ion and those who were my men. Ion stared at me as his eyes narrowed and his lips thinned into a straight line before he rushed outside the dining hall and went to search the palace. The room was soon empty with soldiers, and only the servants were left. I could not believe what I heard. The boy could not be missing. How could he leave in that condition? I stared at Laras in panic and unleashed my wrath upon him upon realizing that he had not left my side to follow the swordless swordsman. Disobedience at its finest. Find the lad. I shouted. Forgive me, my queen, he said. But my place is with you now. I saw the way Ion looked at you, and if the boy is not found, I'm not sure what the general would do. I shuddered. Not because I was afraid of the general, but because of what the boy meant to my son, the emperor. How many times would I have to tell him that the boy wasn't the one who would kill him? It was the lad. The swordless swordsman would be the one to cut his head off. I stood up and walked briskly. Soldiers immediately surrounded me. Laras was before me, and a dozen other soldiers loomed in on me. Find the lad. I ordered Laras. His eyes met mine levelly. Ahari, Laras shouted. A soldier moved forward. Find the performer. He is not to leave the palace yards. Announce it to the guards. Capture him, he said without breaking his eye contact with me. Ahari bowed once and then ran away to obey his lord. Piper San Diego. I sat on the horse with Kino tied tightly against my back. It was difficult because he was not awake, and he could not use his power. I had to be the one to make him invisible. I was anxious as I waited for Arden. Please be here, I whispered to the moons. Please bring Arden back here. But I sat there helplessly without seeing any movement anywhere. From where I was, I could see the rushed movements inside the palace yards. They were probably looking for Kino. And Arden, if he had better sense, would know that I had rescued Kino, and he would be running straight to us. But no. To Arden, it seemed like the gold coins were more important than us. Where could he be? When soldiers started to rush out of the palace gates, I would have no other option but to go without Arden. I hoped that the ropes binding Kino to my waist were tight enough. And then, to my horror, the palace gates opened and a throng of soldiers burst forth. They were riding hard. Ion Noto. Find the boy. I shouted. The soldiers raced to their horses, and one by one, they rode and started galloping away. But at the gates, the queen's soldiers barred us. No one is coming out tonight. Her Majesty's orders, the soldier said. I yelled at the soldier, tell her majesty that I take no orders from anyone but the emperor. Then I gestured at my men. Bring the palace gates down. My soldiers rallied and fought the queen's soldiers until their armors were bloodied. When not one of the soldiers holding the gates was left standing, my men rushed towards the gates to open them. Find the boy. No one will sleep tonight until we get him back. I yelled. I kicked at my horse and searched for anything moving outside the palace yards. The Swordless Swordsman There was a lone horse in the middle of the road, the one that I left with Piper. The horse turned and was about to gallop away, so I decided to do something fast. Wait! I shouted. The horse stopped, and I could almost sense Piper breathing out in relief as I climbed behind Kino's back. As soon as I was mounted, I turned the horse invisible. Now all of us were invisible. Even if the soldiers passed by us, they would not know we were here. The horse's hooves thumped the ground louder. We cannot outrun them, Piper, I said. I was still flushed from running. Keep still. 
I could hear my own heartbeat amidst the sounds of the horse's hooves against the ground. Do you have a plan? Piper asked. No. But we'll get through this. I kicked at the horse, and it moved forward slowly. All around us, horses were prancing madly. Piper turned to look at me. If they bump against us, they will know where we are, she said nervously. Don't worry. No one will, I said, although I was pretty sure that in a few seconds, someone may bump into us. We could not gallop at high speed because our horse was carrying three people, one of whom was unconscious. It would be dangerous to risk it. I looked around, trying to find a way to save ourselves. A huge boulder was situated about a hundred yards from where we were. I kicked at the horse. Hold on, Piper. We're going to race them to the boulder, I said in agony. Then I kept on kicking at the horse to make it faster. I pulled the reins to the right, and the horse followed, someone was riding fast behind us, and we were about to collide. I had no choice. Hold the reins, I shouted to Piper. Then I wielded my sword and thumped the blunt side of the sword against the soldier behind us. He fell to the ground, and the horse ran wildly. I muttered under my breath as I watched the soldier be trampled by the other riders. Faster, Piper. Towards the boulder. We have to get behind it, I said. There are so many of them. Our horse is fighting against me. She said. I grabbed the reins back and pulled at them hard towards the right. The horse took a sharp turn to the right. Then I kicked at the horse, again and again, to make it gallop faster. In a few seconds, a hundred or more soldiers would be on a stampede towards us. There was no time left. I glanced back and saw the horses gaining speed. Any moment now. When I give the signal, pull the reins hard, Piper. I shouted. We were about ten yards from the boulder. Now. I yelled as I pulled at the reins. I felt Piper tugging at the reins as well. And our horse slowed down as soon as it passed by the boulder until it halted. We watched from behind the boulder in gratitude as all of the soldiers headed straight on. For now, we were safe. I breathed out in relief. Are you all right? I asked. I'm scared, Piper said. Her voice was actually quivering. Don't worry, I said. We'll take the opposite route. They will have no idea where we went. The night is dark, and I can feel a storm coming. If it rains, our tracks will be covered by the puddles. But should it rain, we'll leave tracks that would be harder to cover, she said. That's also true, so I did not say anything more. One problem at a time, I told myself. One problem at a time. Ion Noto When it was clear that the boy was not to be found that night, I urged my soldiers back to the palace. I would make the queen pay. The gates were closed again, and there was no way for us to enter. I rallied my men. They shouted behind me, urging the gates to be opened. From the top of the gate, a queen's guard stood up. He removed his helmet. The queen no longer welcomes you in a mare. For the blood that was shed tonight, Her Majesty is most forgiving in not taking you as captives, Laros said. That foul fiend. Tell your queen that Ion Noto does not and will not take any more of her orders. The blood that was shed was minuscule compared to what she made me lose. I yelled. We will ride hard, and the Emperor will soon learn about how his mother, your queen, I said sarcastically, betrayed him. I raised my right hand that was holding a sword. My army is ready to take down your walls tonight. Laros put his hand in the air, and almost at the same time, guards rose atop all parts of the palace gates. Bows were drawn and pointed at us. If we so much as moved in the wrong direction, Laros would not have second thoughts about giving the order to shoot us. I stared at Laros, remembering the contours of his face. I will not forget this man. I was fuming because we lost the boy. I would not let this rest. I vowed to make the queen pay for what she had done. I put my sword back into its scabbard, turned around, and started galloping away. My men followed me towards Canella. I was still fuming when Rodora rode up beside me. 
General, she said. It would interest you to find a traitor among the group, she said. I stopped my horse abruptly and gazed at her face. My eyes were searching hers. Rodora looked behind her and nodded at the other soldiers behind her back. They pushed forward a man who had his hands tied behind his back. His head was bowed. I jumped from my horse, eager to face the man who changed the course of my fate. Show me your face, I said coldly, but he did not obey me. I walked over and kicked the man's head so I could gaze at the traitor's eyes. He lay sprawled on the ground, face already bruised. But when his eyes met mine, I could not believe what I saw. Rigan? What have you done? I seethed. I pulled him up and punched him, throwing him yards away from where I was. I had forgotten how strong my power was, and now I had no desire to even attempt to control it. My rage was feeding my power. What have you done? I shouted. I walked over to where he was. His face was covered in blood, but I caught a slight smile on his lips. He stared at me. The honorable thing to do, General, he answered. This weak man let the boy escape. I should have known better not to trust a man who had nothing to live for. The moment he lost his wife and son was also the same time I lost the spirit of a once valiant soldier in his person. A dead man cannot be killed a second time. I pulled at my sword and swung. Metal hit the flesh and bones of his legs. He shrieked, and it broke the stillness of the night. Even the dead can still feel pain. I stared and spat at Rigan for the horrendous thing he had done. We're not going to leave him behind. He has to suffer the consequences of his actions, I said. Bind the part of his leg where I cut it off. Don't let him die because of blood loss. We will feed him, so he remains alive. When the wound is festering, we will clean it. When it is clean, we will make it burn, and when it festers, we will tend to it again. He will suffer for all the days that he will still live. I will not have him die with honor. The edge of my sword shall not touch the vein that runs in his neck. Then I walked away, leaving my men to do their tasks. No one betrays me. Better they are reminded about it every now and then. That night, I could swear that nobody slept soundly except for me. Rigan had shrieked all night. To the soldiers, it was the sound of a warning, but to my ears, it was the voice of assurance that no one would dare betray me now. Mm-hmm.